Welcome back to the Green Rush. Gary Whiting, he's a founder and CEO of LeBlanc c &E. We're going to be talking about everything that is cannabis today, starting off with genetics. Jerry, thanks for being with us. Thanks for inviting me to the conversation. Topic dear, dear to my heart. Yeah, man, we always talk about something new uh, every week on Friday, live from 4 to 6 Eastern. Uh, and today I was... Uh, Picking the topics. So a little bit later on today, we're going to talk about uh, growing. Friends of ours at Washington Bud Company are going to jump on and talk about uh, farming as well as the folks in Tennessee who are growing called Flow Garden. I don't even think it's legal to do. So we're going to ask them how they're doing it and what they're doing. But uh, until then, I want to talk to you all about genetics, man. So before we jump into what you're doing with the project out at Washington State University with some genetics, um, I kind of want to just set a baseline and, and ask a simple basic question, man. Like, not who cares, but like, what's the point of genetics? Is it important? Why is it important? Uh, let's start from there. So whatever aspect of the cannabis or hemp industry you're in, it all begins with the plant. And um, the one thing that farmers of hemp or cannabis can't control is the genetic makeup of their crop. They can change from one cultivar to another, but the the primary issue I see, especially in the hemp market, is the matchup between the genetics and the end product grown in your location. So the genotype and the terroir. Uh, I know this from firsthand experience because for two years, uh, a childhood friend and I tried to grow industrial hemp in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. Uh, it didn't work because the genetics we were using came from uh, more northern latitudes. The only good news was that our dismal results were matched by U uh, New Mexico State University, the Ag School. It wasn't us, it was the location. So with corn, wheat, soybeans, tomatoes, spinach, carrots, whatever, these are established crops grown by thousands of people over generations. And you can't move the farm, but you can change what you plant there. So whether it's you're using 4-H, uh, your county extension agent or your local seed salesperson as a resource, it's pretty well dialed in um, with most crops except hemp. The problem being it hasn't been grown in the US for you know 70 odd years or whatnot. And so we're beginning again, and the good news, bad news uh, was the 2018 Farm Bill that legalized industrial hemp, but it came at a time when everyone was obsessed with CBD, mm -hmm. and it skewed what people planted and why, because for years, the activists' mantra was hemp, food, fuel, fiber. All of a sudden, medicine elbowed its way in. Um, but now that hempcrete is in the National Building Code, think about how much hemp has to be grown to supply Home Depot and Lowe's. And all of a sudden, what's been a niche crop um, will take its rightful place uh, on the Chicago Board of Trade. It'll be a big ag commodity grown at plantations by corporations. Um, in the end, you still need to know what to plant and how to cultivate it in order to, um, A, turn a profit. But if you're growing it like a real crop, you'll have purchase agreements signed before you plant that, you know, it's like having a, an advance for a book or a CD. Um, your customer who bought that purchase agreement fully expects you to fulfill that come harvest time. How does a farmer know? Well, that's a problem because the genetic terroir matchup hasn't been established. Now it's in China and Canada and France and, and Eastern Europe where there wasn't prohibition and over generations, uh, two things. People learned what worked where and they had indigenous cultivars to start with that were already fine tuned in. Now, the good news is, well, you know, obviously there was an interruption in the prohibition during the Second World War when the Japanese held the Philippines and the military, the Navy didn't have access to hemp for rope. 
They then strong-armed American farmers, especially in the Midwest, to grow hemp for the war effort. Hemp for victory. Now, what we, <laughs> and I love this part. So of course, after the war, it, they went back to prohibition. The, those plants, we knew were fiber cultivars in ag land where the neighbors weren't next door necessarily, you know, lined up like a city block. And birds naturalized hemp for victory, much of which still exist in these pockets today. That's a gold mine because extinct is forever. If the last of those hemp for victories that were nat naturalized by birds for 70 some years disappears, there's no way back machine, Mr. Peabody notwithstanding, and we can't retrieve that genetic treasure trove. So one of my modest goals has to be has been to collect uh, exotic hemp and cannabis seeds, and then make sure that they get passed on so that those don't disappear, um, like cutting down the rainforest without figuring out what's in there. So to that end, um, uh, I have contributed forty one cultivars to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's hemp germplasm repository in Geneva, New York. And they're growing, they're having universities grow about, I think it's about seven of them that are growing one of the cultivars, growing seed crops this year, but it's one of these living museums, if you will. We don't want to burn books at the library at Alexander. We don't want that last um, feral hemp for victory survivor to be uprooted by law enforcement. With, not without I don't care if it's tissue culture or seeds or whatnot, extinct is forever. So that's my 25 words or less elevator pitch yeah. about the importance of genetics. So why why does it go away? Because I know Acapulco gold and the, some of these um, you know, uh, old school strains, Colombian gold and white widow. You, unfortunately, you might even throw blue dream in there, which to my understanding is because around 2018, we had a um, an early rain and a lot of the outdoor folks got rained on. It destroyed their crop. And a lot of a lot of them were like, screw this. I'm never growing again. It takes too long. It's not a high yielder. I'm going to do something else. Right. If you look at traditional uh, agriculture with the avocado, the Haas avocado is what we eat, not because it's the better one, but because it ships more, 24 per box instead of the really big um, original ones. And they only fit like 12 per box. And even though those were preferred, these other ones are easier for distribution. So when you think of like normalization and distribution and um, getting it to, to the end user, you got to think of all these other unfortunate situations. Right. right. So we have thick wall tomatoes because the, the heirloom yeah. ones are, are easy to bruise in transit. And we all eat one kind of banana and that is being threatened now. So yeah. Um, I really, you, mentioned, you mentioned terroir, Jerry, about like how why people choose it, but I'm curious: is it because of like money or other reasons too? Like, why don't we have consistent cultivars or better, better opportunities? Or because people don't get the foundation like other crops of, as I mentioned, 4-H, training kids, um, watching grandma and grandpa continue what they were taught, or. Um, your extension agent having access to the knowledge first and foremost. There, some of those things. Acapulco Gold is still around. I smoked some yesterday, um, uh, but I'm also, as well as working with the USDA's Hemp Germplasm Repository, there's a parallel effort in Humboldt, uh, the Legacy Project, that is identifying. Um, heirlooms from northern california now granted it goes back 30 40 years but these are things that were specifically bred in one region not even the rest of the emerald triangle and they're putting the results of this database or the database on a blockchain so one of my goals is to introduce the humboldt crowd in the legal and sometimes illicit genetic pool to the USDA because once cannabis is off the schedule list, there's every reason for the US Department of Agriculture to catalog and store and sponsor field trials of all of the cannabis sativa L spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
Tell me a little bit about on, on the uh, university, you know, grander scale of what um, a college like Washington State University would want to do with genetics. Oh, so um, I met the Wazoo uh, hemp program through our working with the Yakima Nation last year. And um, they grew 27 cultivars in one location, um, fiber, and some were dual purpose, um, grain on top, fiber on the bottom. Um, and it was fun because some of them I had grown, some of them I knew about, and never had a chance to, to see and play with. And um, it's, there are a number of universities that are focused on two things, exploring the spectrum of uh, hemp uh, genetics, especially for fiber, um, and also building a local resource for farmers in their state. So obviously Washington State University is supported by Washington taxpayers, and one of the primary missions is to support Washington farmers. So um, hopefully um, uh, they will identify out of the 27 they grew last year and whatever they're growing this year, what's best for the taxpayers who support that institution to grow, to build the local economy. Um, my relationship is when I first met David Gang and his staff, I had a spreadsheet of the 41 cultivars I gave to the USDA. He studied it and looked up and it was like, so you know Zach, yeah, I know Zachary. And from then on, it was hashtag bromance. Uh, they realized that this guy they had never met before was playing the game at a relatively high level. Uh, they invited me to um, take home, they wanted to harvest growth data. They didn't care about the plant. And so I was able with their support to bring home lots of hemp stems to play with doing uh, my backyard and kitchen R&D, um, uh, making paper, making textiles, uh, hemp crete, um, hemp plastic, et cetera, et cetera. In the spring, they approached me and asked if there was a research project field trial that I had in mind, they would sponsor me. And yes, I did. It's interesting. Um, uh, and, and, and my goal, it's a so I hate, I came from software and I retired to do hemp. Now I'm back in software. So looking at this pool of data, I want people to use science, not rules of thumb, heuristics, and stuff they read on the interweb to cultivate, sell, and process hemp at an industrial scale so that hemp does replace trees in some situation or cotton or whatnot, and that people do it in a um, ecologically sound manner. So what's been nice with not just getting hemp to play with, but I'm the only one making anything. So when I make hemp paper, I bounce some back to wazoo. When I uh, hackle it to be spun into, into um, textiles, I send them some. I'm now ready to write a report up that contrasts two of the things that they grew, Neo and uh, Carmagnolia, because I've worked with both of them and it's like one's a poodle and one's a, a, a husky. I mean, they're, they're, yes, they're all canines and they can, they can breed, interbreed, but no, there are qualities to the different cultivars that um, need to be exposed and expanded. For instance, if you as a farmer have a purchase agreement with someone who wants to make hempcrete or hemp wood, building materials, they want the herd, the woody part on the inside. You need to find a cultivar, you need to find genetics that has a larger herd to bast ratio and figure out how to plant it so that you have more than your purchase agreement. You can fulfill what you signed a contract for and get paid out at 100%. But since there's no expiration date, you now have stuff that you've already made a profit on that you can save for next year or find another buyer. So, um, but the key is having something that grows. So Wazoo, Washington State University has field trials on both sides of the Cascade Mountains. The weather's wet and damp on the west side facing the Pacific. It's a desert dry on the east side. Um, obviously 
there'll be situations where things that thrive and make money for farmers on the dry side won't work on the east side, you know? Um, but at this point, we're all playing pin the tail of the donkey in a dark room in the fog. So a little science with this, the project's called Space is the Place, named after the Sun Ra song. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this because I'd like to help the hemp industry and not CBD, the industrial hemp industry move towards a big ag model done correctly, not with Roundup, and um, to take its rightful place at the CBOT in the Wall Street Journal, because it will be up there with um, wheat, soybeans, cotton, everything else grown Um and which is a difference between the small CBD farmers, which at first were able to at least break even, if not make a modest profit. And the, the what, you know, I mean, these plantations that grow wheat and soybeans, I, I, I try and read farm reports and it's like daunting, but we're talking thousands of acres, thousands of acres, which is a good thing, but we don't want it done like processed food and, and spraying chemicals and whatnot, destroying topsoil. So that's my mission. I'm going to start studying for my um, commodity, uh, the National Commodity Futures exam for yep. October. So uh, wish me luck. Hopefully, hopefully right before uh, MJ BizCon, I will be fully licensed to be able to trade that because I fully expect that to happen as well. Yeah. yeah. But when you talk about those genetic qualities and everything, um, what is the best way for somebody to get there? Cause we, we talk about tiger seeds and when you have these stripes on the seeds, that's supposed to be some kind of folklore or maybe it's legit. Yeah. I don't know. But what about clones? We talk about F1 and how good they are. Like everyone talks about how their genetics are fire and yet it's just a meme. What is it that truly makes a good product? Uh, you know, like whether it's cannabis or hemp, is it seed or is it clone cuttings? So, depends on your requirement. There would be times, and I just read about this on someone's website yesterday, that they brag that their genetic material was varied, which gave them a broader chemovar. The, the, the terpenes and, and uh, cannabinoids and other compounds made with their made by their cousins, not identical twins, made better medicine because it was a broader spectrum of chemistry. And they said that, well, what this means is um, every time we do a harvest, it's more like wine. It may be the same Pinot Noir um, vines, but the weather changed, be it the amount of sunlight, the amount of rain, when the rain came, et cetera, et cetera. There are other times when you want genetic uniformity, um, which yes, it's monoculture, which has its own risks, but um, for example, we go back to the farmer who wants to sell to the build, building industry. Um, I know when I approach a processor and they like what the, what's in their hand, the second question is, how much of this can you provide consistently moving forward? Because as I use your plant material to grow my business, when I come back next year, I need the same thing. I don't want to have to recalibrate every year. Um, so it's going to end up being a varied market. Um, I hope to whisper in the nascent evolving hemp uh, uh, farm ecosystem, you know, let's not make the same mistakes with monoculture. Um, let's not have bee colony collapse when all of them go to uh, the Central Valley for the almond harvest, which has now dropped the water table there. Let's do this in a regenerative, ecologically sound manner moving forward. And there's urgency because it's I reached the realization that when you say climate warming, you assume that it might happen in the future or what? No, it happened years ago. Tahoma, Mount Rainier lost three glaciers and there's another one threatened. That's my playground. Those are not coming back. And there's fires in Canada, which here in Cascadia, here in Seattle, Canada was our plan B. Canada last week had 900 fires. Ask the people in New York, Boston, the Great Lakes that are getting the smoke. We're never going back. So there's an urgency around using hemp as an instrument of change and helping us evolve with the planet that we've screwed up. Mm -hmm. yeah. End of lecture, but you know. No, I, I think it's a good time for a smoke break. It is 420 on the, on the East Coast. 
So we're going to take a commercial break. But before we do that, Jerry, where can people get a hold of you at if they're interested in picking your brain a little bit more uh, about anything that is hemp, cannabis, genetics, or otherwise, how can they get a hold of you? So the comp- my name is Jerry Whiting. The company name is LeBlanc CNE. LeBlanc is Whiting in French, L-E-B-L-A-N-C. And the CNE is Cannabis Négociant Eleveur. We're grower brokers following the Bordeaux model for grapes. Um, I don't own all the hemp by any means, but I like to think I have some influence and lots of connections and ear to the rail about the hemp industry. So LeBlancCNE at gmail.com, LeBlancCNE uh, dot com um google jerry whiting and hemp and i'm bound to show up like a bad penny he's everywhere <laughs> with that i think we're going to take a quick smoke break we're going to come right back we got a couple of guests we're going to chat about all about cultivation growing all that good stuff so you don't want to miss it we'll be right back with more on the green rush with that we're going to roll this one up i'm josh kincaid this is the talking hedge don't forget to like share and subscribe or don't and i'm out Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.